just another story of the same. Hi, this is the Baltimore Bureau podcast for the first week of May, and I'm here with Easy and Baynard today. What's up, y'all? What's up? So, uh, you know, we'll talk about this more, but but um, a couple of years ago at this date, at, at in early May, May 4th, we were getting out of, of what turns out to have been an illegal curfew. Uh, oh, yeah. So if yeah. you've been out in the last week past 10 o'clock, uh, remember your civil liberties and that, that you don't always get to do that in yep. this city. Unless you're white and live in Hamden, in which case you can do whatever you want all the time. Yes, indeed. Yeah, that was a weird night because it was also a Mayweather fight. And like a bunch of people had fight parties. And... Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's crazy because that's what <laughs> happened to the guys. Some of the guys who are now in 300 Gangsters went to a Mayweather fight watch party. They got back to their place and on video... Uh, the BPD came into their house and arrested them inside their house with no warrant for violating the curfew. Oh, wow. Uh, and it's, it's on video and was still. There was no repercussions to BPD about that. Um, you know, and, and that's how I ended up meeting those guys when I wrote about them back at that time. Shout out to Erica Bridgeford from Baltimore Ceasefire. I'll never, I'll never forget her uh, going live on Facebook in a supermarket in the county making fun of everybody in the city for being on curfew. She was like, she's like, we out, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> so we had this year on May, last three years ago on May the 1st, Marilyn Mosby stood on the steps of the war memorial, announced the charges against the officers in the Freddie Gray case, and we'll work back around to that uh, with my sort of ongoing obsessive coverage of of the state's attorney's race. But this year on May Day, we had Taya Graham and Stephen Janis covered a protest uh, that was partly railing against police brutality and police overreach here in Baltimore, but also about poverty and the kind of violence that is poverty. And and uh, it's a really pretty powerful story. And we can see again and remind us of the militarization of the police, too. Yeah. Stephen tries to ask them about their military uniforms, the police who are out at the protest wearing the the olive green it's it's bizarre yeah it's interesting we covered may day uh quite a bit that i <laughs> i ended up watching the wrong story i watched uh <laughs> the may day in cuba which was interesting though because in cuba they actually celebrate uh the workers rights that they already have versus like you know here usually may day we pick you know something to fight for or push for or advocate for or rally against um, but in Cuba, for the workers, it's like a celebration. It's, uh, you know, um, actually like celebrating the things that, they, that they've that uh, they gained. Um, one guy talks about re- retiring at 65 and actually having resources and things like that. So, Yeah, and, and we also, so go to, if you can go to therealnews.com and you can watch that. You can also watch uh, Jessel Newer, part of our Baltimore Bureau, did a story on the really, the protest in Puerto Rico against austerity there. Yeah, talking against, about fucking police militarization that's yeah. a prime example of that yeah, yeah. yeah so we'll, we'll check out this one in baltimore now let's watch this is taya graham reporting for the real news network in baltimore city maryland today we take the eight hour workday for granted but things like weekends and worker safety were unheard of in the 19th century which is why people around the world celebrate may day to commemorate the beginning of a labor movement that has changed the way we work the holiday is tied to a dramatic event in labor history the haymarket bombing in chicago which killed half a dozen police officers and many labor activists it was a gathering to protest for an eight hour workday but today in Baltimore, we talked to marchers who gathered near City Hall for their own May Day celebration to discuss the present state of labor and how the past informs the present and their hopes for the future. Well, May Day is first of all for the workers. And why it's important to me, not just in Baltimore, but all over this country, is that it is a time that people sh- could come together, because that's the beginning. That was the starting of May Day, that what, what, what it was about, to come together and um, fight. For me, May Day means 
everybody standing together for our mutual benefit. Uh, it's uh, the opportunity to show that we work to help one another, which is what I believe the fundamental basis of this country ought to be. Uh, working together to lift each other up rather than creating hierarchies that keep people down. What is this? Is this like a new uniform? You can't talk. But this kind of looks militaristic. Is this a military uniform or? I've never seen it before. You can't talk? Okay. What did he say? He said he can't talk on camera. But it's not military? But doesn't it look kind of military? I mean, not. Oh, you're just a regular military. When did, when did the department start issuing these uniforms? Can't talk. All right. They're going to tell poor people that they're going to raise the rent because we have to do these. Something's wrong with that. We can continue to accept that nonsense coming out of that, coming out of that, 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 that nest of, of nuts down in D.C. No justice, no peace, no racist police. No justice, no peace, no racist police. No KKK, no fascist USA. No cops, no KKK, no fascist USA. No cops, no KKK, no fascist USA. just asking for a $15 minimum wage. They're not just asking for their neighborhoods not to be gentrified. They're also asking that police officers who commit crimes against residents be held accountable. And what's interesting is that we have, or rather the protesters, have been followed by police this entire time. As well as, I don't know if you can hear it, but Foxtrot has been overhead. The helicopter, the police helicopter, has been circling and following these protesters the entire time. So they had an escort of at least five police officers, as well as a police helicopter, escorting them throughout the city during their peaceful protest while they're asking for police accountability. Um, we're seeing, you know, attacks on immigrant communities. We're seeing attacks on the homeless. We're seeing attacks on workers, uh, which ultimately drives down wages, uh, exacerbates a lot of social ills, and um, you know ultimately creates a, a less safe and a, um, a less uh, egalitarian society. You know, the current minimum wage, which is, what is it, $8? That is not enough for people to be supporting themselves. And honestly, these these minimum wage jobs are some of the riskiest. The people who are making like $30 an hour in air, um, air controlled offices uh, versus people who are flipping burgers at McDonald's, getting burns constantly, getting yelled at constantly, having to be hustling, hustling, hustling for eight or more hours a day. They deserve more. So this sign is for justice for Baltimore workers. Um, we're out here fighting for 15 hour. Um, we're fighting for health care for workers. Um, you know, uh, especially an end to sub-minimum wages for service workers. Uh, I am a bartender myself and it is very, very hard to live on um, tip share. And um, we're also out here, you know, fighting to abolish the BPD. This is Terry Graham and Stephen Janis reporting for the Real News Network in Baltimore City, Maryland. All right, so that was some of the things that people are are struggling for, and, and you know we were just talking about in Puerto Rico, where one of the real problems is still fresh drinking water, mm -hmm. and they're having a really hard time. But of course, we have that in other parts of the United States as well. And some people are there is a bill introduced that is trying to stop that, and you wrote about that this week, Darna. Yeah. So this is the you know. There, this uh, legislation or a version of it has been introduced several times. Uh, this is the Water Act, W-A-T-E-R, um, which stands for something that I can't remember. Um, and basically it would create like a $35 billion trust fund to go to municipalities to um, improve water systems and sewage and stuff, um, which is, you know, I it was inspired by uh, the just horrific water crisis in Flint. Um, but here in Baltimore, we're actually under consent decree to improve our water systems, too. So uh, would have pretty big implications here. Um, you know, there are some people who are uh, very supportive of this legislation. I talked to some people who helped write it. Um, but also, of course, like with Congress, the way it is right now, it's pretty unlikely to pass. And then also I spoke to some people who are critical of the way that uh, funding would be handled. They said that some people say that trust funds aren't really the most effective way to get uh, money to municipalities. And part of it deals with people who are getting their water from wells and yeah. the kind of stuff that, that, which isn't something we really think about 
here in the city getting your water from a well, but it can really cause. Uh, you talked to somebody yesterday who. Yeah, who, uh, yeah. This uh, would make funds available in a couple of different ways to private wells, um, and there's just like so little uh, regulation on like standards for well water. Um, I spoke to somebody yesterday who got a rare disease from a private well in Florida and like a bunch of other people did too. She told me that she woke up, realized that she had a tumor that was super rare, thought she was going to be the only instance of it, but then found out that five of her neighbors had the same kinds of tumors. So, wow. Yeah. Pretty wild. And, and so you also did there, there's another uh, print story that you can check out that, that Darna wrote on the, on trash. And so it's, it's on the one hand, we got to keep our water clean coming in. And then how do we keep it clean by not, pumping trash into it. And uh, I mean, the county is, you know, the, the shout out to Erica for being in the county saying, ah, we're <laughs> out. But the county's shipping how much trash to the city? Oh, mm. man. Uh, it's like it's somewhere up to s- over 60 percent of the county's trash is coming into the incinerator, uh, which wow. is wild. Um, so, yeah, as the county is developing a new solid waste plan for the next 10 years, a bunch of activists are telling them to not renew their contract with the incinerator. Uh, and this is the big is, Bresco Tower you see if you're driving in yeah. or out of town. Yeah. That, uh, and, and it's pretty much always smoking. Yeah. And you're going Partially there tomorrow, because, right? Yeah, I'm going to go, or rather, no, I'm going to the landfill tomorrow. I'm going to the incinerator in a couple weeks to see hundreds of thousands of trash being uh, burnt and then uh, tons of ash in a landfill coming from that incinerator. It's toxic ash. Pretty cool. It's weirdly beautiful. I went there several years ago for a story for Urbanite, Rip to Urbanite, and oh, yeah. it's it's a weirdly beautiful sort of uh, uh, scene in there. It's bizarre. Yeah, I'm excited. So uh, another anniversary coming up is, and back speaking of the county again, look yeah. at these transitions. We're just fucking <laughs> this shit. Um, <laughs> we have, it would have been seamless had I not pointed it out. Uh, we have, uh, Mark Steiner is talking about the 50th anniversary of the Catonsville Nine. Yeah. yeah. I week. love that story, man. Um, it's, for those who don't know, the Catonsville Nine were nine Catholic activists that were protesting the Vietnam War. And they took uh, almost 400 files, uh, draft files, yeah, people draft like people. being drafted for the Vietnam War, and burned them in the parking lot using homemade napalm. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm excited. I haven't seen it yet, but I'm excited to watch this one because that's that's one of my, I think one of my favorite like Baltimore area stories that um, we forget about. And another example of like you know people um, doing some really radical uh, activism and protesting. And it's amazing to think now. I mean, one of the reasons it was successful is the draft board only had one copy of this shit. It wasn't digital. There weren't it's like a very good yeah. point. You yeah. burn it and it's yeah. gone. Yeah. And so yeah. you actually it wasn't just a symbolic act. It actually had like vast consequences, yep. both on saving lives of people here, not getting sent there, and lives of Vietnamese people. And um, that was what one of the guys he who Mark's talks to realized it was they go to, uh, there was the Baltimore Four before there was the Catonsville Nine. Yeah. Mm. And they went and poured pig's blood all over them all. Mm-hmm. And in that trial, they said, well, these are the only records. You could have destroyed them. Yeah, yeah. one of the Mark's guests <laughs> oh, actually yeah, one yeah, of the Baltimore Four. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so let's roll in. And, and we're really happy to have Mark Steiner, radio yeah. legend in Baltimore, yeah. on uh, the Real News Network here. So let's roll in and listen to his dulcet tones talking with uh, about some really important stuff. Welcome, folks. This is Mark Steiner. Good to have you with us here on The Mark Steiner Show on The Real News Network. We're approaching May 17th, and May 17th is the 50th anniversary of the Catonsville Nine. The Catonsville Nine was a dramatic thing that happened here in Baltimore, in Catonsville, Maryland, where nine people went to a draft board, destroyed the draft records, which at that time was a huge thing because those were the only records that existed for men about to be drafted to be sent to Vietnam. It became a huge cause around the country when they were arrested, and there's huge celebrations taking place over the next two weekends to remember what happened on May 17th, 1968, with the Catonsville Nine. We have with us people who were involved there. Dave Eberhardt, who was part of the Baltimore Four that preceded the Catonsville Nine. He went to prison for that act when they dumped blood on the draft records here in Baltimore City. He's a noted poet. He spent time in prison for the acts he did in 1967. He spent two years in prison at Lewisburg Federal Penitentiary. And his latest book is his memoir, 
for all the saints, a protest primer. Dave, welcome, good to have you back with us. Thanks, Mark. And joining us here as well is Joe Trapea. Joe is the curator of films and photography at the Maryland Historical Society, co-director of the award-winning film Hit and Stay, which is about the Catonsville Nine, and he's appeared with me numerous times, a great filmmaker and activist. Good to have you in the studio. Thank you, Mark. It's great to be here. And Leah Michaels, who is a Baltimore native and a social Catholic feminist activist here in our community around the country. She is co-filmmaker of the internationally acclaimed film Rock, Rage, and Self-Defense, an oral history of Seattle's Home Alive. She also helped co-direct the Baltimore chapter of Hollaback uh, with Brittany Oliver uh, here in Baltimore, and good to have you in the house with us as thank well. Thank you, thank you. So let's go back to that moment in 1968, Dave. I mean, you were at the heart of all of this. You weren't with the Catonsville Nine, which I want you to describe for us what that was. You were with, a, with the Baltimore Four that did a similar thing, dumping blood on draft records. But talk, take us back to that moment. The Baltimore Four uh, action took place a week after a giant demonstration at the Pentagon where the yippies and hippies uh, held hands and encircled the building this to levitate. October 67? 1967. October 67, right. I was and there too. Yeah, that I was the that. 21st of October. Then the 27th, right. four of us, myself, Tom Lewis, Phil Berrigan, and Reverend James Mangle, uh, went into the customs house on Gay Street where the draft boards had been collected for their own safety from various points around town, used various ruses to go back to the files, pulled them out, poured blood, which we had uh, put in Mr. Clean bottles, and then uh, sat down, waited for the authorities. We preceded the nine. Baltimore Four. So let me talk about the significance of this event. Uh, you made a film about it, Joe, and you lived through it growing up because of your parents and the world you were in, Leah. Yes. So let me start with you. Sure. I mean, uh, and I just, for our listeners, or for our viewers and listeners here, to, to kind of talk about the significance of the Catonsville Nine. Why was it, why did it ring so loud for America at that point, for you, and for your generation as well? Well, I think it's really important because in, in one way, you know, I'm also an artist, and so there are lots of kind of important things that were done that the Catonsville Nine had ideas about. One, you know, the Baltimore Four when they were using blood, a lot of it's also like symbolic and having to do with, you know, of course, like the blood that Vietnam War was causing, not just for Americans, but for um, people in Vietnam. And then you move forward and they start to figure out at that point that the draft boards didn't have copies. So if you destroyed any of the draft files, then you'd potentially be saving people from going to the Vietnam and also potentially saving people in Vietnam from being killed by any of those people who might have been drafted. And so then you start looking, you know, it, the Baltimore Four wasn't necessarily a specific Catholic action and then the Catonsville Nine was um, all people who were Catholic. Either they were kind of rebel priests or rebel nuns or lay people and looking at how Catholicism really should be based on and is connected to social justice. And then what does that mean, right? And so when they started figuring out that there were no copies for these records and maybe if they could take as many as possible and kind of destroy them in this really symbolic way with homemade napalm and setting them on fire and then circling that in prayer and staying to get arrested and then explain why they were doing it, like that was, would have been huge. And then, so that's what they did. So, Joe, and you made the film, yes. Hit and Stay. Hit and Stay, A History of Faith and Resistance. Why don't you pick up that? So, so the, uh, the idea for the Catonsville Nine actually came from the trial of the Baltimore Four, uh, and one of the members of the Nine heard in court that the Selective Service System didn't have backup mm -hmm. copies. So the idea was they poured blood at first, but maybe the second time we do it, we should burn them so there's nothing left afterward. Um, so, so they, ma they made homemade napalm. They got the recipe from a, a U.S. Army manual. I mean, basically it was uh, jellified gasoline. And so the thing is the U.S. government used to purchase it from the Dow Chemical Corporation and they dropped it on Vietnam to defoliate the jungle so that it was easier to determine where the enemy was hiding. But they didn't clear an area before they dropped it, so they ended up dropping it on you know, trees and people alike mm -hmm. 
indiscriminately. So they got together, the members of the Nine got together a, a week before the action and made homemade napalm in uh, Bill O'Connor's basement. And out Bill of- Bill O'Connor then, by the way, for people, he was a professor in Baltimore who was a noted radical activist and a Catholic as well. Yes, right. uh, he was one of the support activists. Uh, uh, working with the Nine. Um, yeah, they made the napalm in his basement and they transported it to the Selective Service Office in Catonsville and got the files outside and, and dumped it on and, and did their thing. But what was it about this event that became such a significant moment in our history? I mean, it became a play, it became your documentary, it became, it went to Broadway if I'm right, Catonsville Nine, or what, anyway, it went around the country as a, as a play. So what, what, what it was it about this event that was so significant? I mean, why do we even bother remember it 50 years later? Well, I think uh, th their idea wasn't just to destroy files. They wanted to grab attention. They wanted to, to shock America into realizing what was happening. So they, they did that as Catholics to sort of uh, shock their church into taking notice. But they also knew, and they were very media savvy, that it would shock the nation to see priests in handcuffs. So Phil and Dan deliberately wore their Roman collars for the action and were filmed and photographed being put into a police wagon in their full Roman garb. Uh, it, it was an action that grabbed attention at the time and, um, and they, kept, they, they kept it going. They, uh, throughout their trial, they kept uh, you know, trying to get media attention. And then after the trial, uh, rather than go to prison, some of them went underground um, to, to keep the momentum going, to keep the message alive. And it, uh, it resonated with people. Uh, within less than five years of the action, the U.S. government discontinued the draft. And I think it's one of the most uh, effective political actions in American history. I mean, if you look at the Boston Tea Party, which happened in 1773-ish, um, <laughs> it, uh, it took until uh, 17... Circa. Circa. <laughs> circa, <laughs> yeah. It took until 1783 uh, to, to make it, you know, before the revolution was won. So here was an action that within five years had massive results. Go ahead, oh, Leah, and I was also going to say to build off that and kind of going back to one of the other questions you asked about, you know, like why does it matter and all of these other things and how does it affect kind of like my generation of activism, activists now and Catholics now, it was also like they, it was so interesting because they were able, not only did they do this action, but they were able to stay for a while and have like say prayer, but then have everybody kind of say a piece about why they were doing it and all of these other connections that it had. And so it was, you know, the Vietnam War in general, but also the fact that, you know, people of color were being drafted and then they didn't have rights here, you know, and like what did that mean for Vietnam and what did that mean to be an American? And then you also had um, people saying like, we understand that not just Vietnam, but lots of other countries and people in other countries are suffering in order to like bring goods to America and all of these other, I mean, it was this kind of whole, like Vietnam as a symbol for all kinds of civil rights and social justice issues that were going on and that like America benefits from the pain of other people. And so what does that mean? Like, how can we, the nine thinking, how can we as Catholics and as Americans and as citizens do something about that? So I, I, in a moment here, I, I want to mention each one of their names and talk about who they were so we understand who these people were and what they meant. But I, I, Dave, let me ask this question first and we can talk about this for a moment together. The film is called Hit and Stay that, jo that you made, Joe Tropea. You made a very clear statement about when you dumped the blood or, and when Leah, you were describing what happened in Catonsville, the Catonsville Nine. The people did their action, they stayed waiting to be arrested, mm -hmm. as opposed to hit and run, right. do the action and get out, right. right? So what's the philosophy? What is the political meaning of the idea that you stayed and waited for the police to come and be arrested? I mean, that's well, something, that's almost an anathema to some people. It has to do with a theory of nonviolence, um, taking responsibility for your action, being transparent, um, and making a theater out of the whole event uh, and going to trial and uh, with the nine you had uh, great writers in Phil and Dan Berg and Dan 52 books, a great poet and his play The Trial of the Catonsville Nine. So talk about media savvy. Um, but hit and stay 
hit and run, you don't get to appear <laughs> with the press. Mm -hmm. I mean, the press actually drove us to the action of the Baltimore Four, which we, they would never do today. We had WBAL at the Catonsville Nine. Which is a local TV yeah. station here in Baltimore City. But if you run, which many actions took place, inspired by ours, but uh, where people didn't want to get caught, uh, you, you miss the theater part of it. Yeah, definitely. I think there's a lot of being able to control the narrative when you hit and stay, like Dave was saying. And so then, like, you know, they called the press beforehand, like there was a plan for, for all of this. And then when you're able to have that time to really control the, your own narrative of why you're doing it. And you try to control it in the court, right. which they wouldn't let us do by and large. But they, if you found a somewhat liberal judge, right. they would let you talk. And in the Camden 28, uh, the jury sided with the, with the actors because right. an informant had uh, entrapped them. But uh, as the trials went on, more and more was allowed to be said. I mean, you find with the trials of the actors in the plowshares actions now that they're not allowed to bring in justification defense as a higher moral law. They, Depending on the judge, they keep it out. So this is it's important kind of to focus in for a moment because a, a couple of things you mentioned: one is plowshares, one is the other things that took place in the country, country because of the Kingsville Nine, um, and what that what that inspired other people around America. So we want to come to that, but I think that it's important here for a moment to kind of um, re reflect on on what pe what happened to people in in that in that demonstration. I mean, you went to prison, you spent. 21 months. 21 months at Lewisburg Federal Prison. Mm -hmm. uh, Dan and Phil Berrigan, did they, both went underground. F and Phil and they and were, were captured and went to prison. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mary right? was underground for nine years until Mary she. Mary Moylan, you're talking yes, about. Yes, Mary Moylan. She was one of the Catonsville Nine, and she was underground for nine years before I think it just started getting to her, and then she turned herself in. So this is significant. I mean, these are people who put their entire lives on the line. Right. To stop young men from being sent to Vietnam and stopping Vietnamese from being killed by by right. destroying draft records. Yep, and, that, and to call action to all of all of the things, the racism and and everything that was going on, and, and also to challenge really the Catholic institutional church, right? Because as you pointed out before we went on the air, Leah, there's a right and a left here when it comes to the Catholic church. Right? Oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> it's so funny when people when this kind of comes up and people are like, oh, so are you Catholic? I'm like, how much time do you have? You know, like <laughs> it's so complicated because people think they when they hear Catholic, they automatically assume like incredibly conservative, right? Because you know, a lot of the things that the Catholic Church as an institution has done. But I'm like, no, no, you don't understand like the hippie liberal social social like radical Catholicism. Like that's the that's the kind of side. <laughs> and liberation theology yeah. all throughout America. And right, definitely. And, and really, and they talk about too, when you look at like Jesus as a person who was this socialist, you know, like storytelling, mystic Jew, you know, like who invited everybody to dinner, like everyone, you know, the tax collectors and the poor and everybody. And I think that's, that's the kind of like social gospel mission that the Catonsville Nine were kind of focused on. I, I want to mention these names. And let's, I'm going to mention them, and you please describe who we're talking about here, these human beings who stood up and became the Catonsville Nine. Your comrades in arms, I mean, you, you, were, you were with them night and day. That was part of your world, Dave Everhart. So, I mean, um, and I'm glad you're still with us to be able to tell this story. But, um, and this, I'm reading these out of our, actually Dave Everhart's memoir. Um, but George Mishy, who's still with us. Mm -hmm. and George Mishy is who? George Mishy uh, was a labor organizer and army veteran uh, from, from Minnesota who is still with us today, living in Minnesota. Uh, he was the member of the nine that attended Dave's trial for the Baltimore Four and got the idea to burn the files instead of pouring blood. And then we have also in the Catonsville Nine, uh, Father Phil Berrigan and Father Dan Berrigan. Let's take them one at a time. Well, Phil. I like to put them together. I mean, you okay. imagine it's these fine. handsome, charismatic priests. They both were, too. Uh, yeah. right, right, so right. media savvy, great writers. Uh, Dan, 52 books, as I said before. Phil had been uh, in World War II. He saw uh, it was the a combat. He was an artillery veteran. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And then um, uh, Dan, as a Jesuit, um, at any rate, the writing powers uh, 
and the uh, radicalism is just uh, charismatic. Right. And Dan had been to Vietnam, right. so he had seen, right. you know, children dying and, and right. just the devastation of that. He'd had bombs dropped on him. I think he was Amos. arrested 250 times, spent the most prison in Danbury uh, for the Catonsville Nine. So let me go through these. Is it Tom Lewis. Tom Lewis uh, was a, uh, not a Baltimore native, but moved here um, from high school where he was a high school football star, and he had been recruited for the Colts by Johnny Unitas, but instead of that, he, uh, he worried about his art career and went to Europe and studied art, mm -hmm. and came back and was radicalized during the Civil Rights Movement. He was sketching in uh, Gwen, Gwen Oaks Park uh, while some demonstrations were going on, and he became radicalized. To integrate, to, to desegregate Gwen Oak Park. Right, right. right. And uh, he <sighs> became radicalized and became a part of the Baltimore Four, and then put himself in legal jeopardy by Being acting again. again. So yeah, so Tom and, and Phil had already, with you, had all already been arrested when they decided, let's do it again. <laughs> yeah. so let's go well, we have our time, let's go through these. I just want people to know these names, as right. we say in these days, say their name as we right, say in today's course. world, right? Yeah. Yeah. David Darst. David Darst was a Christian brother from the Midwest. Uh, he was uh, among the youngest members of the Nine in his 20s, and he traveled uh, from the Midwest to take part in the action. I guess the network went that far that he heard about uh, some plans in, in happening in the Baltimore area. And a person who I got to know really well before she left and went onto ground, who I really have always admired my entire life, is Mary Moylan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mary Moylan was a, uh, was a nurse. She trained at uh, Mercy. And she went on mission to Uganda, where she worked as a nurse, and was sent home for being too uh, radical, and uh, which turned out to be a bad move from her institutional <laughs> perspective, because <laughs> she ended up staying with George Mishy uh, at his house in D.C. and became part of the plan for the Catonsville Nine. And John Hogan? Mm -hmm. John had been in uh, Latin America, I believe, um, yeah, John was a mission missionary in Guatemala and uh, was sent out of Guatemala for being too radical, uh, getting too close with what they considered communist guerrillas, which, which meant farmers, basically, right. uh, that he was sent there to work with. And yeah, he was sent home and, like Mary Moylan, ended up in uh, the D.C. house with Michi and became part of the plan. And, and finally, Marjorie and Tom Melville. Tom, had, I guess my show... Well, the Melvilles too. really uh, bothered their... Uh, orders by, I guess Marjorie was the more, Margarita we say, was the more radical and actually went into the hills with the gorillas. <laughs> I don't know about uh, Tom, but um, again, a good writer, several books. They were, um, uh, they were Mary Knoll missionaries that were sent to Guatemala and sent home at the same time as Hogan. So they were kicked out at, uh, by the authorities in Guatemala, I guess. And you were going to add what, Leah, to that? Oh, and just, you know, they wound up married. And I, it was interesting, too, that Margarita says in one of the films, in Lynn Sachs' film, actually, Investigation of a Flame, when they were, you know, communism was such a huge, obviously, issue at the time. And, you know, she says, oh, I understand. Like, when you're fighting for the poor or when you're fighting for the underdog, then you're a communist, you know. And so let's talk about what goes on these next two weekends uh, as we celebrate this 50th anniversary of the Capesville Nine. It all starts uh, this Friday, May 4th. Um, at UMBC, there's a symposium. It's basically an all-day symposium. It runs from 3 to 10 p.m. And uh, we have Kathy Kelly and uh, Frida Berrigan is coming, who is, um, the, daughter of. is the, the oldest of um, Phil Berrigan and Liz McAllister. And, um, and Marjorie, like we said, Marjorie Melville, she's, she'll be joining us, who's one of the surviving members of the Catonsville Nine. And um, there are lots of other wonderful uh, events that are gonna be happening um, on Friday. And then Saturday is uh, some commemorative events, including uh, the keynote by Amy Goodman. Um, and that's gonna be held at the Presbyterian Church in Catonsville. Uh so there's a whole weekend worth oh, of yeah. events. Oh, yeah. There's a whole week. There's actually a whole month. I a feel like we have all and kinds so, of so, things going so on. So all, all of our viewers around the country, <clears throat> there's time to come to Baltimore yes. to take part in these events. <laughs> yes. Uh, and you can go to catonsville9.org right. uh, to find out all this information and become part of this history, to celebrate this history, uh, and to celebrate the people who still survive and are still carrying it on. 
Um, you mentioned Liz McAllister. Let me just say Liz McAllister is not doing time in prison uh, because plowshares that came out of the Catonsville Nine is a movement where they attack war nuclear warheads uh, at different sites. She just did that. Liz is 78 years old now uh, and uh, is doing time in prison. And her daughter Frida, who will be here, actually has written a beautiful piece about uh, talking to her child about why their grandmother can't mm. be there and is doing time in prison mm -hmm. uh, for fighting for humanity. So Also, a roadside sign is going to be erected and on dedicated Saturday. on Saturday. Which is yeah. important. Yes, yes. for historical Department marker. Of, uh, highways and uh, And other things. And yes. So <laughs> how about that endorsement? On Saturday, there will be uh, members of subsequent actions like the Milwaukee 14, and the Camden 28 uh, that'll be taking part in events. Um, and that's one thing we didn't get to talk about was the actions that came after Catonsville. Right. Uh, I charted about 30 in, in my research. Right. And mm -hmm. Brendan and Willow will also be there who run Viva House, which is another really important um, community base for Catholic social Catholic workers justice. base here in Baltimore. Yes. And I think that is a really important piece of this, which is the all the kind of similar actions took place all over the United States because of the Catonsville Nine. Right. Uh, and it inspired thousands and thousands of people to resist the draft in the United States, to resist the war in Vietnam, uh, and it became a seminal event uh, that I think has to be remembered. And, I'm, and it means a lot to have all three of you with us here at the Real News Network. Leah Michaels, good to have you here. David Eberhardt, Joe Chapea, always good to have you around with us. I thank you for you so much. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. Thank you. And stay involved, stay committed. Come check this out in Baltimore. You don't want to miss these events. I'm Mark Steiner for The Mark Steiner Show, right here on The Real News Network. Uh, you just heard Mark Steiner on the Catonsville Nine. This is the third Steiner Show on The Real News Network, which is very cool. Um, he is having on really, really interesting guests, so that's, it's nice to be able to work with him here. It's the fourth even, I believe. Oh, the fourth. Maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, because there was there's Bill Ayers and there was uh, Chelsea Manning and then Eddie Conway yeah. and then this. Yeah. Mm. So and Dere Smith. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, so now we have uh, the third part in a, another ongoing series, and and it's really, I mean, this is this one's a, a really so Taya Graham's been doing really spectacular work on sexual harassment in Annapolis at the state capitol, and. Um, you know, this this one's a, a hard listen in some ways. It's yeah. it's one hundred percent. I think it's really uh, crazy to see how how many news outlets are not covering this and how much people are not talking about this. And I think it speaks a lot to the amount of power that's in Annapolis. You know, you got Senate President Mike Miller, who like is alive and has the Senate building named after him. You know what I'm saying? Um, and so it's. It, it's not an easy these 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 pieces are not easy to watch but very necessary i think um and and just it's just the whole lack of coverage i think just speaks volumes to the amount of power that's being held in annapolis yeah and i feel like these pieces also show like uh, the impact that this kind of shit has on everything like yeah. you know the obviously like the the women who are speaking out are the f like first and the worst affected but then they also talk about like you know, if I try to speak out against this, if I try to do anything about this, uh, all of my bills will be killed. Nobody will take me seriously yeah. in the session. So, like, also, mm -hmm. in addition, like, think about all of the, you know, uh, legislation that might even not be heard because... Yeah, because women are having trouble finding allies. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and while, while these women are talking about it, while Taya's doing the, the great journalistic work of interviewing it, it really is a, a man problem. It really is our yeah. problem. And so there need to be... I mean, it's it's spectacular that... that Women are speaking up, but like now it's it's really time for for the dudes up there to yeah. start like speaking yeah. up or getting the fuck out. Yeah. yeah. Hello, my name is Taya Graham and I am a reporter for The Real News Network. As a journalist who covers our state capital in Annapolis, I was troubled to learn of allegations of a culture of sexual harassment that suggests implicit tolerance for it and a system that does little to address it. That's why I decided to conduct a series of interviews with an organization that has been trying to address this issue, not without black women. In the third part of our conversation, we discuss just how little recourse there is for women who feel they have been mistreated. We also talk about solutions and legislation advocates hope will make this workplace a safer, more productive environment for everyone. 
My guests are Brittany Oliver, a women's rights activist and director of the social justice organization Not Without Black Women, Delegate Angela Angel, and Nina Smith, a communications consultant and former Annapolis staffer. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. I think that one of the things that, especially with Not Without Black Women, what we have found is that a lots of women, um, these these are not stories that I've heard for, I hear these stories all the time from women who, within our organization. And so when we come together once a month um, to have our sister circle talks where we, we meet at um, you know different restaurants and venues across the city, and you know we talk about uh, we just have you know food and drinks and kind of social time and talk about what issues we're going with. The, this is what I hear. This is what I listen to. Um, and so, not without Black women is dedicated towards empowering women mm -hmm. to take back their power and trying to find ways for women to feel there is someone that cares about you and that supports you and that you can make a difference. Right. And that was really what the overall goal is with with um, the, getting this bill passed. And um, I wanted to add something in to what uh, Nina had mentioned about consent. Another aspect of uh, that Not Without Black Women wants to focus on in partnership with Hollaback Baltimore is to drive the narrative and the conversations around bystander intervention. Mm -hmm. Bystander okay. intervention is how people, yeah. when when you're in a space and you um, are being harassed or abused in some sort of way, how do the people around you, what is the role that the people That's around you play, important. right? Um, because you don't have to be a rapist to perpetuate, you know, to perpetuate this culture. Right. There are a variety, and this is what makes up, this is what makes up institutionalized sexism that creates rape culture. Because there are more than one, there are people who make up a system that allows survivors to not feel protected. Mm -hmm. So the people in your life, whether they're at work or at home, your friends, your family, how are they standing up to protect you? Are they speaking up? Are they, do they have the skills to do so? Right. And so one of our goals moving forward from this is to uh, continue to talk about this issue, but also action steps mm -hmm. on, how to move, on how to move forward as well. Now, and, oh, go ahead. And that's actually a part of the training that we've talked about for the legislature mm -hmm. that's gonna come in. Um, and it, that was one of the things that came out during one of our Women's Caucus thing, and, and I brought it up, um, is bystander training because I think in Annapolis, part of the reason why it becomes so outrageous mm -hmm. and the culture is because many times these things happen in front of other people. Mm -hmm. And I'll admit, I've had um, colleagues that things have happened in front of me and, and I'm frozen and I don't know what to do. Like this is someone who's over me, who if I piss off, you know, who knows what the, the repercussions could be. Right. Um, and so including that bystander training, you know, for women, for other legislators, I, in some ways, you know, I understand why, you know, when a senior member did something to me and there's another senior member, maybe they don't know how to react, right? Because once again, heck, they can hold their legislation up. Right. But figuring out how to say that. Um, and even, for instance, one of the things I think probably by my second year I began to do is um, when like coarse jokes were made about friends of mine, or, or and I will admit, mostly friends that I would, I would stick up for, I would be like, you know what, that's out of line. You know, and they'd be like, oh, come on, Angel. And I'm like, you know what? I'm not, I'm not, and, and, and I did in such a way, I was like, I'm not trying to come, I'm not gonna get all bent out of shape, but I'm just gonna say like, you shouldn't say that about her. And, 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 and I began doing that, but that was something that, and it probably took till after like my second year. Um, and I think even, it, this was after the incident with my building held on the floor. Mm -hmm. And I think part of it was just like, I've seen the worst that, you know, I've seen what y'all do. So right. part of it was just like, you know, I've been hit with their best shot. So I, I, I'm, I'm tougher skin now, but um, being able to do that, and, and, but having someone that trains and does this type of bystander training work for other, for the members of the legislature, and that's one of the things that the bill has asked that, that will be incorporated, is super powerful to change the culture. Right. And, and that's what we, that's what's needed, you know. There's a culture change because part of what has happened is this has become acceptable. Mm -hmm. It's, normal. It's par for the course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so in some ways, you know, and I'm always cautious, right, because I don't want to excuse behavior. Right. Um, but I, I understand how, for some of these folks, like, this is just what's okay. 
Um, you know, this is what they've always, since they've came into the legislature, this is what they've seen, this is what's happened. It's actually better now. Hmm, that's what they call it. it it's yeah. sad, but it, in some ways it's, it's better now than what it used to be, because from what I hear, you know, there were certain legislators, like, back in the day who were, like, out and out, like, actual assault was more rampant. Actual rapes were taking place. Wow. Um, and, and so this is, you know, and it's also as we see progression. People were raping their fellow legislators and staffers. They're committing sexual assaults. I mean, I'll put it to you this way. If you heard about stuff, it wasn't necessarily shocking. Oh. Um, I know after, over the course of my tenure, and, and again, the, that was the arc of my testimony, I started out receiving the advice, I left giving the advice. Okay. I see what you're saying. Yeah. Now, B Brittany, I'm going to switch a little bit because I know you have mentioned something called hashtag Maryland Me Too, and I'm, I want to know what you're going to do next. But first, I want to ask you a little bit closer to home. You've already tackled Annapolis, but there's other governmental agencies that have cultures of sexism that need to be addressed. The one that comes to mind for me is Baltimore City Police Department. Mm -hmm. We know back in 2016, they had the Department of Justice do an investigation which showed that there was sexist, sexist unconstitutional and racist practices, mm -hmm. which led to the consent decree, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So some of the things police officers did was unfound rape reports, misclassify them, poor treatment of women, uh, having women exchange sex for their freedom. And to this day, I don't think it's illegal for a police officer to have sex mm -hmm. with someone who he has arrested and is in his custody. Mm -hmm. We changed mm -hmm. that. You we have, passed, you, we, you we have passed, just passed that? We passed a bill this year that... It did, it did get done? Yes. Oh. I, need to I, I, I think so. Yes. I can't remember. And, and the I irony is I sat in on that. I sat in on the vote session mm -hmm. of that bill. And, and it was interesting that the legislators that were voting on the bill were like, that's not. They're like, it's illegal already. They did not know. Wow. That it, in, that there was this loophole, and I remember after the session because I was aware of it, going up to them and being like, um, "You know," I was like, because they they tabled the bill at first, mm -hmm. and I said, "You all need to pass it." I was like, "It's a loophole that it's not it's not covered," mm -hmm. and so I remember talking with um, with the folks on that committee. They're like, "We're going to pass it." They were like, they were just, but they had no idea that there was this loophole that allowed for that to happen. Mm -hmm. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. um, so we know that the police department uh, has an incredible number of bad actors in it, some mm -hmm. really sexist practices. What can Me Too do to address the issues of women in Baltimore City, for example, when they're dealing with law enforcement? Sure, so what I can say, um, so so from the Baltimore uprising um, and with the consent decree, what came out of that, I was actually one of the um, advocates that worked on getting, getting the consent decree passed. During that time, I was working with the ACLU, and I was also working, um, I was also uh, directing Hollaback Baltimore. And so the benefit of, um, of advocacy around, around both organizations, um, or my affiliations with the two, is that we were able to focus a lot on, on these disparities around women specifically um, in their interactions with, with police officers. Um, and I remember doing a number of uh, community discussions on those, on those issues. I actually had held one here at the Real News Network. Um, and so I think that, right, MD, hashtag MD Me Too was basically, the point of coming up with that was just to localize um, Me Too since it had started out in Hollywood and kind of on a national scale. And so we wanted to add the MD part that stands for Maryland to that hashtag so that folks in the state of Maryland, um, survivors could feel that this issue means that this means is in your community as, as well. Um, what I'll say is that the work that we've done in Annapolis, the reason why I was so passionate about going forward with this legislation and doing all the work necessary to get it passed is so that it can pretty much serve as an example for when we get back to Baltimore. Okay. Um, and Right now, what, the way I like to describe what's happening is that this is, this is a movement. This is where, this is a movement where we're gonna have to start getting some wins out of these issues. And so le legislative, um, do, you know, do, getting a bill passed, you know, and so if we can get a bill, a bill passed on this issue in, in Annapolis, which helps, which is making a difference, we can do the same thing, you know, in, in Baltimore. And so I think that right now, one of the things that, um, you know, that we can do in Baltimore specifically is one, we can believe survivors. Right. 
when survivors are speaking out, whether it be through a tweet or social media, or in, in, in any instance, believing survivors first, because it's coming from somewhere. Even if they're not naming their abusers or harassers, it's okay for people to not name, because that's not the issue. The issue is the culture right. that has allowed, that, that has taken away survivors' power from being able to advocate on the issue. So believing survivors, I think that we also need to find a way to have a culture shift in the narrative about rape culture. Um, this is not an issue that only affects white women. Right. That is a false statement. It is a Absolutely. false idea that rape culture, abuse, harassment, street harassment are white women's issues. We need to stop telling women of color particularly black women, that these issues are not theirs because it is. Absolutely right. It's harmful. It sets us back. It doesn't move us forward. And if we are about unity and creating change, and especially under you know, the current circumstances we're happening right now under the administration, the presidential administration, all these different battles that we have, that we have um, that are coming towards us, if we really are dedicated towards creating change in this city, from whether it be from Baltimore to Annapolis to the entire state, we must start allowing a moving, creating space for, uh, for women of color and black women to take up, um, to take on these issues in a way that's most meaningful to them. Um, a third thing I would say, a, a third, um, you know, in terms of action for Baltimore specifically, I think that we need to invest resources um, and funding to women such as myself mm -hmm. who are doing the work right. and who have been doing the work to, for l little resources. Okay. Not Without Black Women is a volunteer organization. Right. And we've only been... We've only been in, been doing the work we've been doing for eight for for over for about eight months. And you've already had a major victory in Annapolis. It's really quite impressive. Mm -hmm. So start investing, inv allowing survivors, because I'm a I'm a I'm a survivor myself. I'm a sexual um, sexual assault survivor. I'm a homicide survivor. Put us in position. Put us in pos positions of leadership for us to advocate on our own issues so that we can get the job done. Put people, invest in people who have the most skin in the game to get the job done, because that's what we did in Annapolis. Um, and, and also, um, I'd say another would be, in terms of the police, is working with other organizations who are doing this work finding a way to collaborate with other entities who are doing this work, such as Hollaback Baltimore, such as Force Upset Upsetting Rape Culture, um, other organizations, other women who are doing, this, doing the same type of work, and finding comprehensive strategies um, around how do we hold police officers accountable? Right. How do we hold not only police officers, our people, men, who we interact with on a day-to-day -day basis? Mm -hmm. Right. Is there a commission? Can we create a commission so that when women are experiencing these things, they have somewhere to go? In the past six months, women who have contacted me for help and assistance, the number one thing that I hear them say to me is that I'm contacting you because you have a platform. And I don't have a platform. No one will, will believe me. And that breaks my heart. Yeah. Because if I didn't have a platform, would anybody listen to me? That's a good question. Would anybody listen to me or other women if I didn't have access in the way, in the way that I did? Absolutely, or knowledge of the system. Right. And that's right. what helped us. I mean, mm -hmm. it, when you're a former staffer, you know how Annapolis works. Right. Mm -hmm. right. You know, um, you know what the amendments process is. Mm -hmm. You know how to press certain buttons when it comes to. I mean, um, we did a lot of media work, so we were working with reporters. We were talking to mm -hmm. reporters um, about what was happening, keeping them up to date, so that there was that external pressure for them to do the mm -hmm. right thing. Mm -hmm. And so we we were very strategic in how because we knew we had to be. Mm -hmm. That was the only way we were going to. I mean, we could. 
could have gotten. There were plenty of nights where I freaked. I, I freaked out. I lost. I lost my stuff. I, I was crying. You saw me cry a little bit here. Um, you know, it, it's because you're right. We had so much skin in the game. I would add to that that there's a political component here. Mm -hmm. What we're seeing is just this general sense of uh, lack of accountability, mm -hmm. whether it's legislators, whether it's police officers, and the political structures reinforce those things. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, if these officers, if these accusations are happening, who's prosecuting them? Mm -hmm. Why haven't they been, been prosecuted? Are there holes in the law? Well, if there are holes in the law, then why haven't the state legislators, you know, looked at that piece? So I think there are things that we need to be, there are questions that we need to start asking, mm -hmm. right? Um, I think there's an awareness that um, we need to lean into. Um, th these elections aren't pretty, they aren't sexy, they can be boring. I know I, I, for the average person, you know, it's just not their thing. Right. I understand that, but it affects your everyday life. Like, you know, you have that complaint against that police officer. Well, you know, you elect your state's attorney, you elect your judges, you elect your mayor, you elect your city council, mm -hmm. you elect your state legislator. There are all these people who get, um, they're, they're not getting paid astronomically, but they are, this, it's their job to listen to you and to advocate on your behalf. Mm -hmm. And we need to start forcing them to do so. Absolutely. Right. And, it, and it's one of those things that, you know, I have, I'm a part of, a quite, of quite a few national organizations. And in other states, you, you'll notice, like people said, you know, in California, um, where they named people in New York, and in, in other states where they were. I'm sorry, your mic. Sorry about that. Oh, this necklace. Um, <laughs> So I'm, I'm a member of a couple of national organizations that, that have addressed similar issues about sexual harassment mm -hmm. in the legislature, and like you're talking about the police and other things which are still accountable um, to the state legislature because we create some of the laws that regulate their activities, right? And so people ask me, well, why aren't you naming names in Maryland? And why in California they did, they called people out. In other places they called people out. And I said one of the differences are those places have turnover. So it's not the same people in power. Mm -hmm. And so in, in here, you know, you have people who have been in power longer than I've been alive. Mm -hmm. And so, and so they're ingrained. So they're in, and that's, and, and because they've, and because they've been in power so long, and because, like Nina says, people don't pay attention. They go into the voting booth. They push a button. You know, they get a and check off the name they, they recognize. And they right. check off the name yeah. they recognize, or they get a slate. You know, we, and, and especially we're talking about Baltimore and Prince George's County, mm -hmm. where we've typically been run by slates. You get this thing that's told this is the ballot, and people, I've, ballot. you know, you've ever, you've ever walked in. I've, I've, I've worked election. Like, I've got my ballot. That's not a ballot. That's a propaganda piece, right? But people are just pushing these buttons. So, so part of one of the reasons why victims can't come forward is because this person's always been there. They've been there for the past 20 years. What am I, you know, going to do? How am I going to come forward? Because truth be told, outside of um, an actual criminal finding, um, they've rarely expelled a legislator. So the fact of the matter is the very reality is, and one of the reasons victims know, Everyone could find my statement to be true, and this person will still hold their seat. Mm -hmm. Wow! And the and 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 so then and so why would I risk all of that? Mm -hmm. um, and and so and so one of the things as voters is you have to be thinking about that. You know, we we are sending the same folks there. You wonder why some of the laws haven't changed, and why I was so certain this law wasn't going mm -hmm. to change mm -hmm. is because you know the same people that have been there have certain views, and and because the way our system is set up, they don't have to justify why they don't pass a bill. It just goes in the drawer and, and you're not allowed to question them because that's the way the system is set up. And so when we're talking about elections have consequences, you know, if you keep sending the same people back, they have unchallenged and unquestionable power. Yes. Mm -hmm. Unchecked. Unchecked. And that's what we have here, and that's one of the reasons why our culture, you know, and, and it, it's become so insane, and even why you won't have victims, why to this day, we can't name some of these names. These mm -hmm. people are still holding power. Mm -hmm. okay. they're, they're still holding power, and, and if we were to, <laughs> mm. what, <laughs> what I have been assured is what could rain down on us, mm -hmm. right. you can't even fathom. And on that note, I'd like to thank my guests, Brittany Oliver, Nina Smith, and Delegate Angela Angel for joining me for this important conversation and sharing their truths with me. And I want to thank you for joining me, your host, Taya Graham, at The Real News Network. So, I mean, in the, the coming from that story, in, in the state's attorney's race, we had one of the main campaign uh, 
spokespeople in that race for and, and campaign organizers for Marilyn Mosby uh, dropped out uh, two weeks ago now because of having domestic violence charges against him. The charges were filed by the state's attorney's office, and uh, though a special prosecutor was actually prosecuting them, and so it's it's raised a lot of, of questions. It's brought this up in the state's attorney's race as well. And um, Marilyn Mosby, you know, it's put her sort of, she was the one who, who looked like she was going to be in, in politically in the sort of better place with this because we already have Thiru Vignaraja, one of her opponents, was caught on a, a Sting video. It was, it was on the podcast earlier when I asked him about that. No one's ever asked him about it yeah. otherwise, which is crazy. But yeah, where he's is. just... He's not being assaulting, or, or, but he's being kind of a creeper, uh, and and it's 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 really pretty gross tape. And Project Veritas is really gross, also. And so I think that's one reason that. Uh, but people don't want to bring it up. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but it keeps it really being uh, being pretty ugly. So we're gonna watch real quick my where I ask uh, state's attorney's candidate Ivan Bates about this, and then we'll talk a little bit about. Uh, if you don't mind, let me talk after that for a second about the two print stories that I did about uh, the state's attorney's race this week Please as well. Please do. They're great. Yeah, definitely. All right, but let's watch Ivan for a minute first. And this was old before any of the stuff about Mosby's campaign worker came out. So this was a couple weeks ago, but it's, it's still really relevant. The city still reeling from mass incarceration, the war on drugs, and police corruption. The state's attorney is an important role, maybe the most important role in the criminal justice system. And here in Baltimore, we're having a heated race for the state's attorney, which is the top prosecutor called the district attorney in many other places. I'm here today with one of the candidates, a third part of our conversation, Ivan Bates. He's a defense attorney and previously a homicide prosecutor who's now seeking the job of top prosecutor. Welcome back, Ivan. Thank you, Baynard. Thank you for having me again. So. In the Gun Trace Task Force trial, this was a number of officers were indicted by federal authorities and convicted or pleaded guilty to racketeering um, and various other corruption, robbery and theft. Um, and there was a leak within the state's attorney's office that told uh, Wayne Jenkins, with, we've talked about your relation with him in the first part of our interview, um, what would you do to get rid of that leak? The, the current state's attorney did fire someone at the same time that she said um, they had talked to the U.S. attorney's office, but we've talked about this before. You don't believe that Anna Montegna, who was fired, was the leak and that she was treated unfairly by the state's attorney's office. I definitely feel that way. Um, to me, to have the information that the FBI is doing an investigation is a select few individuals, most likely somebody in the current state's attorney's inner circle or a division chief or division head. Anna Montagna was nothing more than a line assistant state's attorney. She wouldn't have had that type of information. So no, I don't believe that. I believe she was nothing more than a scapegoat. But I also recognize why didn't the state's attorney do their own investigation? The second you saw that last, I think we saw March 15th, March 16th of last year, you asked for an independent organization to come and do an investigation in terms of, in terms of the state's attorney's office. Why did the U.S. attorney's office wait so late to give them that information? I know what I heard and saw was that the judge gave a sealing order in reference to all the information that would happen with the trial. So no, I don't believe there was that conversation in that regard because I know the sealing order is what controls on the federal side. They're not going to wait until the case is over then to give them that information. That's the type of information they need to give at the very beginning. And so that concerns me because if you know there's a leak who's working, cooperating with the uh, police and you fire this, this, this state's attorney, well that means every single case that prosecutor has ever touched you have an obligation now to get rid of. Just like you got rid of those other officers' cases, don't you have an obligation now to get rid of this prosecutor's cases? And if the simple fact that they haven't begun to do that, that tells me that Ms. Montagna was not the leak. And, I mean, the, the state's attorney's office, there's a lot of people in it. Um, there's, it's a lot to manage, um, much different than managing a private law firm. How would you, if there were a leak and you were in that office, how would you go about it? I mean, we've seen that police can't investigate themselves. Um, are you saying that the state's attorneys should investigate themselves? Should there be an outside investigator? How do, how do we go about uh, cracking down on corruption, potential corruption, and the closeness between prosecutors and cops that can lead to corruption in a state's attorney's office? There needs to always be an outside investigation. For instance, 
if you're going to investigate the police, I don't think it needs to be the state's attorney of Baltimore City. I think it needs to be a state's attorney's office from another jurisdiction such as Prince George's County because you do have those relationships. If someone in the state's attorney's office is accused of being a leak, then we need to bring another state's attorney's office from another outside organization to sit down and do a thorough investigation. The citizens have to believe in the investigation. It must be transparent. You want another individual that doesn't quote unquote have any skin in this game, doesn't necessarily have the relationships here in Baltimore City. Let's bring them in and let's, them, let's let them do their job so that they can tell the citizens, hey, this is what happened, this is this case, and this is what's, what's going on, and this is where the leak really was. So you've been a vocal critic of Mosby, and she has claimed that much of the criticism directed against her is either racist, sexist, or ageist. Um, how would you, I mean, do you think that's true and um, that she has a higher bar than, than other people may have had because of her age or because of being a woman in that position or because of being black in that position? How would you respond to that? Well, when you're black in America, there's always going to be a higher bar. And when I went to Howard University, one of the things that I learned was that I had to be twice as good. So I think that's something that comes with being black and being in leadership. But I also think it's also something that comes with experience. I think some of the criticism has maybe been, some of it has been unwarranted, but I think a lot of the criticism has been warranted because when you sit down and look at the lack of experience, if you've never prosecuted a case, a murder case, if you previously were an insurance attorney and you did not surround yourself with individuals who were prosecutors, then of course there's going to be criticism. So I think what we also have to do is sit down and look. It appears that we have to stop pointing the fingers at everybody else, but let's sit down and look at ourselves first. And I think when it, you look at yourself first and you look at your, what's going on with your own office, then you can sit and look at other things in another light sometimes. And so, I mean, talking about looking at yourself, one of the, it's a, uh, we have the Me Too movement and a lot of people are suspicious of almost all men um, right now. And, and we're, we're both men sitting here. And so I, it's hard to understand what it would be like to be a woman in America in the same way it's, it's I can't understand what it would be like to be black in America. And one of your other opponents, uh, Theru Vignaraja, there was a, a really sort of sordid and unseemly uh, sting tape from the right wing smear group uh, Project Veritas. Um, is there anything that, that as we're getting kicked off with the campaign that, that you feel like voters need to, that you want to get off your chest, that voters need to know or that you're concerned about as um, in terms of, of uh, sexual issues in, in America right now? I have two daughters. My wife had a daughter from her first marriage and I have my own daughter. We have our own daughter. So when you sit down, I try to think about what my daughters, would they be happy with my actions? Would my actions as a man embarrass them? And I think as long as I keep that in my forefront of my mind and how I treat women, because with my wife, look, my wife doesn't play that. So the interesting thing is the best decision I know I've ever made as a man was marrying my wife because she's made me a better person. She's made me a better man. She's made me a better husband. And she lets me look at things from perspective that I don't always bring to the table. So in terms of the Me Too movement, without a doubt, I understand. And, and you know, that's a movement that, that my wife and my daughters are, are both behind. And it supports them. But I also recognize as a man, it's incumbent upon me in my household to give a good example to my daughters as to the way a man is supposed to treat them, but also the way that a man's supposed to treat his wife. My daughters need to see me hug my wife, kiss my wife, support my wife. My daughters need to understand that it's not about me, but it's about we. And guess what? You are a superstar. So when I do sit down and I look at, at so many of the elected officials that are black women, yes, it, it, what you do in terms of for my daughters to look up to, yes. But I also have to sit down and tell them, you have to make sure that you have learned the job thoroughly. So when you go out in leadership that you know you recognize they're going to judge you and it's going to be hard. And it's going to be very hard. But when you know the job thoroughly and, you, and you, you, you are trained and you're prepared for the job, let your actions speak louder than your words. And for me, that has been the motto I've tried to live by. And for my wife, it's really the motto that I've watched her live by. You know, this is a, in terms of trailblazer, my wife is the head of diversity and equity at McDonough. 
She's the first African-American female administrator that school's ever had. So she's there leveling the playing field. So I've watched her go through her career, and I've watched her have to be the best that she can be. She was the second African-American female to graduate from uh, with her uh, doctorate in education from the University of Virginia. So I've watched, I've seen, and I've listened. And I do recognize it's hard, but I've also seen how women are definitely champions. So a uh, criticism that some people have made, you ended up in a, a sort of, um, you were going to sue the Baltimore Sun, or maybe did sue the Baltimore Sun over a story that they wrote that um, you had obstructed justice in some way because someone received some kind of payment and then, then said that the, the um, defendant wasn't the person who did the thing. Um, and they said you pled the fifth, and you said you didn't, and, and that was going to come to a lawsuit. And they took part of the story down. So, I mean, two questions about that. What happened there? And then how do you see the role of the press in, in uh, cover? You know, we have this fake news and a president who's attacking the press. So both of those things sort of off of this thing to clear the air on that. Okay. Um, I did sue the Baltimore Sun, and it resolved itself out of court, in which I sound very happy. Um, so in that regard, I guess legally that's what I can say, but I was very, very happy. I think what I also learned was that involved a prosecutor who did not know the law. And when they don't know the law, the average any citizen can be harmed. And that's what I've also learned. In terms of the press, you know, when I went to college, it's interesting, I was a, uh, my degree is in journalism. So I recognize the press has a job to do. Um, for me, I just want the press to give me a shot, to give me an opportunity to see who I am, to see what I bring to the table. I do recognize you have your job to do. And for the press not to be biased, but let the, the voters and the citizens sit down and see who we really are as individuals. We need the press. And what the press does, it keeps the playing field level so that we don't have individuals who want to, quote unquote, be dictators. I think when we sit down and see what's going on with uh, number 45 at this moment in time, you see that's a, he's waged a war against the press because he doesn't want the citizens to know the truth. And this press, we need the press because the press allows the vehicle mechanism for the truth to be out there for the citizens. And so to close out, we were, as we were talking before, um, before we started filming, we were talking about various cases and stuff, and you clearly love being a defense attorney. Why give that up to be a prosecutor? You know, that's... Uh, so my wife asked when I told her I wanted to run for state's attorney. It's not about me, it's about the people. The criminal justice system has the ability to level the playing field for everybody. It has the ability to keep people safe. If the state's attorney was doing that job, then I'm happy to stay where I am. But I've learned that one good defense attorney in the role as a prosecutor is better than 100 defense attorneys because the role of the prosecutor, we see the Fourth Amendment violation early on. We can dismiss that case and use that as a te teaching mechanism with the police officer so they don't continue to violate the rights of the citizens. And then if this officer continues to violate the rights of the citizens, that's an individual that now we understand should not be a police officer. So when you are running for that position, it can't be about you, it's gotta be about the people. Running isn't about anybody, it's only about the people and doing what's best for my city. My city's in a crisis, and the way I look at it is like this. When your city's in a crisis, it's like your loved one's in a crisis, and they're sick. And on one hand, you have an individual that the citizens know, they may like this individual, but this individual has never, ever performed open heart surgery, and your loved one needs open heart surgery. They're nice, they may even be your primary care doctor. However, there's another individual that has 23 years of experience, done hundreds of open heart surgeries, and people come to that individual because they save lives. It's simple. The citizens have to make a decision. Are you going to go with someone you like, but with no experience, or are you going to go with someone who has a reputation of being with the best and saving lives? Experience. And I'm offering my experience to the citizens of Baltimore City. I'm the only individual seeing the criminal justice system on both sides. And when you talk about real criminal justice reform, Look at what's going on in Philadelphia, and we're beginning to see the blueprint about real criminal justice reform. Well, Ivan Bates, candidate for Baltimore City State's Attorney, thanks for joining us. Hey, thank you. Take care. Yeah, so this week, a story of several weeks ago in relation to the Gun Trace Task Force, the uh, 
A state's, uh, an assistant state's attorney, Anna Montagna, was fired by uh, Marilyn Mosby's office. They didn't say that she was the alleged leak. Wayne Jenkins, the sergeant of the task force, the almost demonic mastermind of, of this group of, of corrupt cops, uh, said that it, someone in the state's attorney's office had leaked to him that they were under investigation. Um, so they, the state's attorney's office said, yeah, someone, there was a leak, and yeah, we fired this person in the same statement, but they didn't connect those two things. Mm-hmm. And uh, this week, the letter from a- acting attorney general Stephen Shinning came out, as well as a letter from Mosby's lawyer um, to Montagna saying, you were fired because you were the leak. And, and we obtained those letters uh, as well as a number of text messages with between Montagna and Wayne Jenkins, where she's trying to schedule him, it, it seems clear, for a court date. And so it really sheds yeah. a lot of, casts a lot of doubt on this this idea. I don't know. I'm, I'm, what, do y'all, what did y'all think about this story? Because I, I was so deep in it. You know I've been reporting it for months Weeks and months. And, yeah, yeah, months and months. Um, I... <sighs> Part of the craziest thing about about all of this, like state's attorney race or tangentially, I guess, reporting that you've been doing is the characters in these stories, like the actual people are so interesting by themselves. Like Anna Montagna is such a like fascinating, interesting, like weird person. And uh, she's a new like, kids on the block uh, like a super, super fan, fan, which is really, oh, really? interesting. <laughs> nice. um, a, yeah. And that's also that's was also kind of true in the other print story that you put out this week about uh Joe Crystal, um, you know, the Baltimore Police Department is all about trying to say that they want to reform itself, but this whistleblower cop is trying to come back, and that doesn't seem to be really possible. So Yeah, so back in 2011, Joe Crystal, he was a police officer, a drug cop in, in the sort of elite drug units like what became Gun Trace Task Force. His sergeant and some other people in his squad were chasing a guy, and the guy kicked in a door apprentice place as they were chasing him and he ran in and in and the door happened to be out of all of the weird circumstances you could imagine the girlfriend of a different officer mm, who was yeah, unrelated was right. so they put him in the van they're taking him in and then crystal sergeant gets on the radio and says you know bring that van back here they bring the van back they bring the guy inside and they kick his ass and his ankle gets broken and other things and joe went to and, and weirdly of all people he went to anna montagna um, and said, hey, listen, my sergeant told me to keep my mouth shut, or a different sergeant told me to keep my mouth shut. Uh, what should I do? And she went, even though the sergeant, Gia Lamas, was her friend, she went to immediately and called Jan Bledsoe, who was at the time and now is again uh, doing police integrity at the, the state's attorney's office. And she reported it, and it ended up bringing criminal charges. Joe got a rat placed beneath his windshield. People wouldn't come when he called for backup. And he had to leave the department. So he thought when they're now calling for reform and after the gun trace task force that he could come back, even though many people advised him that could be dangerous and they wouldn't uh, hire him to come back. So I'd also been reporting that for a long time and uh, really tried to lay out some of the and and all of the reporting on what happened at the time. He's not allowed to talk about that, um, about any of the stuff with Gialama. So that's stuff that that we had talked about before and that it's just sort of on the record. But his process of trying of what he had to do to come back to be part of the Baltimore Police Department and how they kept shooting him down. Um, and Major James Handley was in charge of that, who was running the Southwest Precinct when Tyree Woodson mysteriously shot himself in the head in the bathroom somehow there in 2014. He also now has recently been demoted because he was the guy who was in charge of the Southwest uh, when there was the roll call that Governor Larry Hogan came to and only four officers were at it. And it made the department look bad. So yeah. they cared more, unfortunately, about that than the guy dying in the office four years. Ago. Yeah, I really like that you've been covering this state's attorney's race uh, so much. Again, another thing that I'm surprised so many people aren't paying attention to. Because all of these stories show just how important this seat is, the state's attorney's seat. And I think... Um, I think beforehand people took it for granted or just kind of like, I don't know, like I just feel like people weren't talking about the state's attorney's race, uh, you know, a few years ago. But all of these, all of this corruption from the police department, all of these incidents all come back somehow to the state's attorney's office. So looking at who the next state's attorney is going to be um, and even looking at it, even in the in the Joe Crystal story, looking at, you know, the new commissioner D'Souza, who is 
constantly out there saying he wants to change things, he wants to make things better, but yet here's a good cop trying to come back and they won't let him. Um, so, yeah, I think I think these pieces are great. Well, thanks, yeah. And, and I mean, the, I think the thing we've, we've all been most excited about this week is, uh, yo, yo, hey, hey, get in my van. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. Um, <laughs> for those who don't know, uh, we, uh, I'm, I'm starting a new show. We started shooting this week um, a show where we're going out um, around Baltimore in the real news van and picking up people. Um, the first day was unsuccessful. Nobody wanted to get. <laughs> nobody wanted to get in the van. What they didn't want to get in a van with you, just like a van full of tons of cameras. Yeah, with, <laughs> with a bunch of cameras around. and three black dudes. Um, they was like, nah, we good. Uh, so yesterday we actually um, got to talk to two women, Sharena Christmas, who's a former. Um, a uh, former employee here at the Real News Network uh, is now doing uh, an, an, an event, a monthly event at Ida B's table. Um, and she talked a little bit about um, we're asking people what 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 they think real solutions look like and just trying to get the opinions from the people, you know, um, of what you know, how to change things. And one of the, the interesting things I think Sharena says is uh, she talks about youth investment. And how, like, you know, the more we invest in the youth and focus on the youth, um, you know, the better tomorrow could possibly be, you know. And, and, and um, I think it's really good. I think the show is going to be uh, interesting. It's going to be interesting to see these conversations and, you know, something a little different. So I'm excited about that. It's your boy, Easy Jackson, <laughs> a.k.a. Easy Pass. A.k.a. Easy Pass, a.k.a. Easy, A.K. Easy Rider. The real oh, Van Jones. Van Jones. The real yeah, Van Jones. A.k.a. <laughs> it's safe to get in the van. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, I think we got, like, yeah, we got, like, a little clip uh, talking to Sharena here. So let's take a look at it. One of the things we're out talking to people about is, you know, what do you... What do real solutions look like to you? Of course, we're, you know, we're in Baltimore. Mm-hmm. Baltimore is a city with a lot of challenges, yep. a lot of different types of disparities, um, and a lot of people talking about you know, how to fix them. Yeah. But from Sharena's point of view, like, what, what do you think, what do real solutions look like to you? So Baltimore is near and dear to my heart. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I run a nonprofit um, for youth called Muse 360 Arts, and you know, it's evolved from being something that I was extremely passionate about to something mm-hmm. that is an absolute necessity. Mm-hmm. You know, real solutions start with the youth at this point in mm-hmm. time in the present. So even if you're a, a you know an artist or creative or a journalist or what have you, when you think about solutions for Baltimore, you cannot you cannot think about the youth because the youth are the pipeline for the next. Totally. leadership yeah. so for me solutions you know are taking our education into our own hands taking our economy into our own hands you're gonna take this left now. yeah mm-hmm. um you know taking you know making sure that we create opportunities for each other and for our youth to make money before they graduate from college so we travel internationally to study the african diaspora let me start mm. there oh yeah that's so right. one of the solutions when i say education we have to teach our young people where they come from specifically in the present so right now like last summer we did um black life in baltimore mm-hmm. but in previous summers we traveled to study the african diaspora we don't get any funding by the way so what mm. our students decided that they would do um, after reading the miseducation of the negro the preface dr carter g Wilson talks about immigrants coming to the country mm-hmm. and they use what they've been taught as kids so whether it's being a farmer whether it's selling oranges on the corner you know they use just their spark of genius that's what he calls it so my students said well we're artists can Mm -hmm. we sell our work or can we perform somewhere and get paid and that's kind of how we empower them to make their own money can we become photographers can we you know intern someplace and you know so when I say like the solutions are working with the youth so that they can find be empowered to use tools that are not new you know what I mean Mm -hmm. so educating our youth about the history of where they come from the history of the African diaspora it implants a value system in you and then from there you say, okay, with this value system and with this talent, I'm gonna make money, make my own money. Mm. I really truly believe, you know, being an entrepreneur for a mental, for mental uh, stability as well as financial stability, um, it could be, it could be kind of challenging. But yeah. I think that we have enough successful entrepreneurs and we have to hold them accountable. There's enough, enough successful social um, leaders, social entrepreneur lead, leaders to kind of help people 
um, yeah. and help young people thrive. So get, getting young people today to think about uh, economics, you know, being their own bosses. And, and education, and, and, and education from a perspective of history. Mm. Because what I find is that every project that I do, you know, I work with leaders around the city. They don't, they, they ask questions to things that they should know the answer to just be based on history. Mm. <laughs> so you mm. add, you know, you might ask why, you know, why is, uh, you know, why, why are black people marginalized? Well, let's look at history. I mean, you don't have to be like, well, because it's, you know, yeah. there's buildings that are empty. No, it's history. So if we can get our young people to understand that history, they will, they are, they will feel more empowered. So we've traveled with about 40 young people internationally. Um, so, and they're now adults in college and they absolutely feel more empowered now. Last night I saw your, uh, Saw your collaborator, uh, Wendell Patrick, and that's yeah. what I was sort of making fun of his impersonation of you there. But he also had some <laughs> suggestions. He's like, why don't you paint your van like an ice cream truck and go around schools? And <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> so it was, so maybe, funny. <laughs> maybe that would work better. He was trying to comment on how bad he thought our idea was, but I think it's... it's like, <laughs> It's so funny, like, <laughs> like I, 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 I have. We got like an equal amount of people who think it's a great idea, and people who think it's a terrible idea. Uh, one, uh, one of our uh, coworkers here swears to God somebody's gonna jump in the van and put a gun in my face. I don't know why, but uh, <laughs> you know, Baltimore's not that violent. Yeah, well, they have to be down to get in a van full of cameras first. Right. So, and they don't know if those cameras are live streaming or not. I think right. you're pretty safe yeah. there. That yeah, that, uh, <laughs> you know. But I mean, who knows? It could be a, yeah. a yeah. police officer or any kind of crazy things could True. happen. But but follow Easy's adventures in the van. I hope yeah. hope to go out one day in the van as well. It's it. Uh, it seems really fun. Look for us if you're listening today or tomorrow on Friday or Saturday. Look for us at the Farmer's Market. We're going to be set up out there over the next couple of weeks also trying to talk to you about what things look like and hopefully coming around to your neighborhood. Yeah, uh, yep. the Farmer's Market downtown on holiday in Saratoga. Yep. Yeah. Big thanks to uh, David Hebden, producer of the Baltimore yeah, Bureau podcast. Um, Dwayne Gladden, producer of the Baltimore video podcast show. Stephen Frank, who does only internet all the time, uh, <laughs> doing doing only our internet, audio engineering time. and um, <laughs> on the fast track to the new website. Yeah. yeah. Um, so keep an eye out for that as we're going. Uh, thank you to everyone out there in podcast land. Give us some more of your money and we can do more stuff here at The Real News. Anybody else we need to be thanking uh, this week? Thanks oh, to y'all for listening. Oh, and, and we have a new intern now, yeah. Serafina Hi, Harper. Serafina. Uh, shout out to her and um, did a, a, in the first week put out a great piece on the J20 case. So that's pretty spectacular. Yeah, definitely check that out because nobody else covered that story. So Yeah, new motions to dismiss those charges. Uh, and all of the May Day coverage, again, the, the Jessel's piece on Puerto Rico was spectacular. Realnews.com, you can donate. You can follow all our international and national news, which, while not covering Baltimore, is useful to you in Baltimore to understand the larger context of what is happening here in exactly. In our small little city. So maybe uh, outro music this week we could go out with. Uh, I, lo I love this. You, uh, Barnyard Sharks, y'all covered Lil Scooter's bird flu. R.I.P. also. Yeah, rest in peace, Lil Scooter. Uh, and with a live horn section, and this was recorded right after the, in the week right after the curfew, so as people were, and this was uh, recorded by Mobtown Studios, so we'll listen to the, uh, the horn section and uh, think of Lil Scooter on the way out. Thanks, y'all. Love y'all, Baltimore.